originally the Manifesto of the Communist Party German, Manifest der Kommunistischen Partei is a political pamphlet written by German philosophers Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Commissioned by the Communist League and originally published in London in 1848, the Manifesto remains one of the world's most influential political documents. It presents an analytical approach to class struggle and criticizes capitalism and the capitalist mode of production, without attempting to predict communism's potential future forms. Karl Heinrich Marx FRSA, the 5th of May 1818, the 14th of March 1883, was a German philosopher, economist, historian, sociologist, political theorist, journalist, critic of political economy, and socialist revolutionary. His best-known titles are the 1848 pamphlet The Communist Manifesto and the four-volume Das Kapital, 1867-1883. Marx's political and philosophical thought had enormous influence on subsequent intellectual, economic, and political history. His name has been used as an adjective, a noun, and a school of social theory. Friedrich Engels, 28 November 1820 to the 5th of August 1895, was a German philosopher, critic of political economy, historian, political theorist, and revolutionary socialist. He was also a businessman, journalist and political activist, whose father was an owner of large textile factories in Salford, Lancashire, England and Barmen, Prussia, now Wuppertal, Germany. The Communist Manifesto summarizes Marx and Engels' theories concerning the nature of society and politics, namely that in their own words, tiki history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. It also briefly features their ideas for how the capitalist society of the time would eventually be replaced by socialism. In the last paragraph of the manifesto, the authors call for a forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions, which served as a call for communist revolutions around the world. In 2013, the Communist Manifesto was registered to UNESCO's Memory of the World Program along with Marx's Capital, Volume 1. The Communist Manifesto is divided into a preamble in four sections. The introduction begins. A specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism, pointing out that it was widespread for politicians, both those in government and those in the opposition, to label their opponents as communists. The authors infer that those in power acknowledge communism to be a power in itself. Subsequently, the introduction exhorts communists to openly publish their views and aims, which is the very function of the manifesto. The first section of the Manifesto, Bourgeois and Proletarians, 6, outlines historical materialism, and states that, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles, according to the authors, all societies in history had taken the form of an oppressed majority exploited by an oppressive minority. In Marx and Engels' time, they say that under capitalism, the industrial working class, or, proletariat, engages in class struggle against the owners of the means of production, the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie, through the constant revolutionizing of production and uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, have emerged as the supreme class in society, displacing all the old powers of feudalism. Ninth, the bourgeoisie constantly exploits the proletariat for its labor power, creating profit for themselves and accumulating capital. In doing so, however, Marx and Engels describe the bourgeoisie as serving as its own grave diggers, as they believe the proletariat will inevitably become conscious of their own potential and rise to power through revolution, overthrowing the bourgeoisie. Proletarians and Communists The second section starts by stating the relationship of conscious communists, i.e. those who identify as communists to the rest of the working class. The Communists' Party will not oppose other working-class parties, but unlike them, it will express the general will and defend the common interests of the world's proletariat as a whole, independent of all nationalities. The section goes on to defend communism from various objections, including claims that it advocates communal prostitution or disincentivizes people from working. The section ends by outlining a set of short-term demands, among them a progressive income tax, abolition of inheritances and private property, abolition of child labor, free public education, nationalization of the means of transport and communication, centralization of credit via a national bank, expansion of publicly owned land, etc., the implementation of which is argued would result in the precursor to a stateless and classless society. The third section, Socialist and Communist Literature, distinguishes communism from other socialist doctrines prevalent at the time, 
these being broadly categorized as reactionary socialism, conservative or bourgeois socialism, and critical utopian socialism and communism. While the degree of reproach toward rival perspectives varies, all are dismissed for advocating reformism and failing to recognize the preeminent revolutionary role of the working class. Position of the Communists in relation to the various opposition parties the concluding section of the manifesto briefly discusses the communist position on struggles in specific countries in the mid-19th century such as in France, Switzerland, Poland, and lastly Germany, which is said to be on the eve of a bourgeois revolution and predicts that a world revolution will soon follow. It ends by declaring an alliance with the democratic socialists, boldly supporting other communist revolutions and calling for united international proletarian action, working men of all countries, unite. In spring 1847, Marx and Engels joined the League of the Just, who were quickly convinced by the duo's ideas of critical communism. At its first congress in the 2nd to the 9th of June, the League tasked Engels with drafting a profession of faith, but such a document was later deemed inappropriate for an open, non-confrontational organization. Engels nevertheless wrote the draft of a communist confession of faith, detailing the League's program. A few months later, in October, Engels arrived at the League's Paris branch to find that Moses Hess had written an inadequate manifesto for the group, now called the League of Communists. In Hess's absence, Engels severely criticized this manifesto, and convinced the rest of the League to entrust him with drafting a new one. This became the draft principles of communism, described as, less of a credo and more of an exam paper. On 23 November, just before the Communist League's Second Congress, 29 November, the 8th of December, 1847, Engels wrote to Marx, expressing his desire to eschew the catechism format in favor of the manifesto, because he felt it must contain some history. On the 28th, Marx and Engels met at Ostend in Belgium, and a few days later, gathered at the Soho, London headquarters of the German Workers' Education Association to attend the Congress. Over the next 10 days, intense debate raged between League functionaries, Marx eventually dominated the others and, overcoming, stiff and prolonged opposition, 10, in Harold Lasky's words, secured a majority for his program. The League thus unanimously adopted a far more combative resolution than that at the first Congress in June. Marx, especially, and Engels were subsequently commissioned to draw up a manifesto for the League. Upon returning to Brussels, Marx engaged in ceaseless procrastination, according to his biographer Francis Wien. Working only intermittently on the manifesto, he spent much of his time delivering lectures on political economy at the German Workers' Education Association, writing articles for the Deutsche Brüsseler Zeitung, and giving a long speech on free trade. Following this, he even spent a week, the 17th to the 26th of January 1848, in Ghent to establish a branch of the Democratic Association there. Subsequently, having not heard from Marx for nearly two months, the Central Committee of the Communist League sent him an ultimatum on 24 or the 26th of January, demanding he submit the completed manuscript by the 1st of February. This imposition spurred Marx on, who struggled to work without a deadline, and he seems to have rushed to finish the job in time. For evidence of this, historian Eric Hobsbawm points to the absence of rough drafts, only one page of which survives. In all, the manifesto was written over six to seven weeks. Although Engels is credited as co-writer, the final draft was penned exclusively by Marx. From the 26th of January letter, Lasky infers that even the Communist League considered Marx to be the sole draftsman and that he was merely their agent, imminently replaceable. Further, Engels himself wrote in 1883, the basic thought running through the manifesto belongs solely and exclusively to Marx. Although Lasky does not disagree, he suggests that Engels underplays his own contribution with characteristic modesty and points out the close resemblance between its substance and that of the principles of communism. Lasky argues that while writing the manifesto, Marx drew from the joint stock of ideas, he developed with Engels, a kind of intellectual bank account upon which either could draw freely. Marx and Engels' political influences were wide-ranging, reacting to and taking inspiration from German idealist philosophy, French socialism, and English and Scottish political economy. The Communist Manifesto also takes influence from literature. In Jacques Derrida's work, Spectres of Marx, 
the state of the dead, the work of mourning and the new international, he uses William Shakespeare's Hamlet to frame a discussion of the history of the international, showing in the process the influence that Shakespeare's work had on Marx and Engels' writing. In his essay, Big Leagues, Specters of Milton and Republican International Justice Between Shakespeare and Marx, Christopher N. Warren makes the case that English poet John Milton also had a substantial influence on Marx and Engels' work, Historians of 19th century reading habits have confirmed that Marx and Engels would have read these authors and it is known that Marx loved Shakespeare in particular. Milton, Warren argues, also shows a notable influence on the Communist Manifesto, saying, looking back on Milton's era, Marx saw a historical dialectic founded on inspiration in which freedom of the press, republicanism, and revolution were closely joined. 36 Milton's republicanism, Warren continues, served as a useful, if unlikely, bridge, as Marx and Engels sought to forge a revolutionary international coalition. The manifesto also makes reference to the revolutionary, anti-bourgeois social criticism of Thomas Carlyle, whom Engels had read as early as May 1843.